What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone and welcome to Bobby Dots Part 2. That's right, we are finishing off the Bobby Dots conclusion. Finally, I know, I, I know a lot of you have been wanting me to finish this book. Uh, it's been quite a while, so I am so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. Um, I actually, like, tried to record this before, but it didn't work out very well, and I kind of lost motivation, so... <laughs> anyway, I'm back. I'm, I'm back, so... You're going to get Bobby Dots Part 2, and then you're going to get the epilogue, and then Nexi is going to come out in two weeks, and we're going to read through all of that in one go. So I hope you're ready for that, because there are some big, big stories in that one. Anyway, Bobby Dots Part 2, if you haven't read Part 1, I do have a full audiobook of that, so go and read it. I am not going to remember all of the voices of the characters, so bear with me. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, this this is gonna be fun. This one is really good. Like, I I think that the that Bobby Dots as a story, like Bobby Dots Part One and Bobby Dots Part Two together, uh, it is an incredible story. It's like really well written, really well done. All the characters are amazing. They're lovable, and I think it's got a really good ending as well. So I think we should we should work towards that. We are halfway through technically. So uh, put on your thinking caps, eat some popcorn or something. I don't know. Anyway, if you don't know what happened in Bobby Dots Part 1, I am not going to explain it to you because the book does it for us! Isn't that so cool? Anyway, let's get straight into this. Abe should have been happy... <coughs> Never mind. <coughs> Sorry. Ah, oh, Abe should have been happy with his recent promotion at the Mega Pizzaplex that had allowed him to live in the Fazplex Tower, but he'd learned the hard way that the perk was not guaranteed. There'd been only one off-limits apartment available when it came time for him to move in. He'd tricked his way inside, hacking the system to give him a place to stay. It had seemed great at first. At least he was no longer homeless and living inside a pile of tyres on Roxy Raceway. And it wasn't just a roof over his head. He had the body dots to take care of him. Olive, Rose and Gemini, each with a different function, were holograms that took care of his every need. When strange things started happening around the apartment, they'd blamed it on the Gen 1 Bobby Dots that lived inside the crawling space of the ceiling. The Gen 1s couldn't be turned off and still tried to help, even though they didn't really understand what, ha what helping meant. They'd already nearly boiled Abe alive and almost caught his hand in the garbage disposal. But lately, Abe was starting to wonder whether the Gen 1s were really the cause of his misfortunes. Freshly showered and thankfully unscalded, Abe moved around his bedroom, getting ready for work. His holographic helpers, the Bobby Dots, hovered on the nearest screen near his closet. Today's forecast, Olive said, shading her green eyes against the glare coming through the window, is for sun. I could have told him that, Rose said, squinting her pink eyes and nibbling on a croissant. Gemini tapped her blue headset. How about some jazzy music to celebrate the weather? The frenetic uh, notes of Dixie-style jazz filled the apartment. <laughs> I love how we're already seeing their personalities come back. It's great. Uh, Rose, Rose is my favourite, though. The one that just eats food all the time. Um, Abe preferred quiet in the mornings, but he was working hard to stay on the Bobby Dot's good side. He didn't say anything about the music. He crossed to his dresser, pulled open the second drawer, and reached for a pair of socks. He pressed his fingers to his temple. The music was giving him a headache. Rose winked into view. Are you okay? Do you have a headache? No, Abe snapped. It's just that... He stopped. He didn't want to complain about the music, or anything for that matter. He couldn't afford the anger the Bobby Dots. He forced a smile. Everything's fine. Olive popped up on the screen next to Rose. You're acting strange, she said. Her green eyes closed to near slits as she studied him. Did she know he no longer trusted the Bobby Dots? Abe looked at Rose. Was she watching him just a little too intently? Abe turned away from the Bobby Dots. Work stuff, he said nonchalantly as he tried to pull on his socks. Abe put on his shoes, pulled on a t-shirt and headed to his bedroom door. He attempted to pull the door open. It wouldn't budge. He jiggled the door. It remained closed. What's going on? He snapped. Oh, I initiated the bedroom door lock for your protection, Olive said. Abe looked at Olive. Her green eyes looked back at him impassively. 
Uh, okay, thanks, Abe said. But could you please open the door now? The door clicked. Abe opened it. Abe couldn't wait any longer. He had to get on with his plan. Abe had decided that the first thing he needed to do was find out once and for all whether the Gen 1s actually existed. Were they real or a convenient scapegoat for his Bobby Dot's antics? If the Gen 1s were real, Abe figured there had to be information about them somewhere in the Pizzaplex databases. It was time for him to use his engineering access. It was nearly 7pm. Abe was the only one left in the office. Outside, the sun was down, but it was still throwing an orange glow across the horizon. The glow fell over the Fazbear Tower and made it look vaguely like a shiny bright carrot jutting up toward the sky. Why had he ever thought it looked like a palace? Abe returned his attention to the computer. His screen displayed a list of all the Fazbear Entertainment's robots. Abe scrolled through the list. He couldn't find any reference to Gen 1s. The only Bobby Dots entry was for the holographic Bobby Dots. Okay, so they didn't exist. Or did they? Fazbear Entertainment didn't always keep records of animatronic failures. It was still possible that the Gen 1's records had been deleted. Abe drummed his fingers on his desk. Now what? He scrolled back through the information and his gaze landed on the links to storage location next to each animatronic entry. Of course, Abe shook his head. The retired and dysfunctional animatronics were kept in the Pizzaplex's underground levels. If the Gen 1s did exist, Abe might be able to find one in storage. It was worth a try. Abe grabbed a flashlight, left his desk, and headed out of the office. He wasn't a big fan of the Pizzaplex's underground. He knew his way around it, of course, but it was dark and filled with eerie animatronic parts. The dungeon-like air made Abe feel claustrophobic. <clears throat> But Abe was willing to face the underground if it helped him solve his problem. Abe took the elevator to the first level of the underground. From here, to get to the lower levels, you had to follow descending tunnels. The first level wasn't so bad. The official storage floor for the Pizzaplex was just a big warehouse. It had concrete block walls and a shiny cement floor. Metal shelves held thousands of boxes and crates lined the walls. At least a dozen or so employees worked down here full time. Abe didn't know any of them personally but waved at the beefy guy behind the wheel of a forklift. The guy nodded. Abe walked on, heading to the dingy opening to the Utilidor. The Utilidor was a dark passage with a metal grated floor. Abe's feet created a metallic cadence that echoed around him as he strode as fast as he could between runway-like rows of red lights that lined the metal gridwork. Above, more red lights barely illuminated the long cramped hallway. The lights threw their red glow over a network of wires and pipes lining concrete walls. Abe always thought the red lights were appropriate for the area, even if they gave him the heebie-jeebies. This section of the Pizzaplex was like its circulatory system. All the complex's utility lines originated here. This area gave the Pizzaplex its life, but nothing about it felt lifelike. The Utilidor was rank and musty. Abe wondered how many small animals had found their way down here and died, their corpses decaying in the moist, warm air. Abe hurried to the end of the utilidor. <clears throat> now for the worst part. Abe's pace slowed as the metal grates gave way to smooth concrete again. The floor sloped downward and curved. Abe turned on his flashlight and swept the area in front of him and on either side of him to be sure he was alone. This was the sewer. It was even darker than the utilidor. A graveyard of damaged and discarded animatronics. It seemed to Abe that the Pizzaplex had enough square footage to designate a friendlier area for robotic rejects, and that it was a waste of money to let their old metal turn to rust. But he wasn't in charge, and this was where the old and useless were left to languish. Abe had reached the sewer level. He squared his shoulders and took a deep breath. With concrete walls and a cement floor similar to the storage level, the sewer area wasn't a real sewer, per se. Yes, a large sewer pipe ran through it, but it wasn't itself the conduit for sewage. You didn't have to slosh through excrement to move through the section. It did, however, smell like you were sloshing through excrement. Or, wait, am I saying... I'm saying excrement, it's excrement. <laughs> oh, I'm so terrible. Um... The odour down here was fetid and nauseating. 
Whereas the storage level was kept clean and brightly lit, this floor was little more than an indoor landfill, and it was infested with wandering, wasted animatronics. Abe sucked in his breath when his flashlight's beam landed on one such animatronic, the pitiful remains of a Glamrock Chica resting against the sewer's outer wall blinked at Abe and raised a handless arm. The lower part of Chica's face was a gaping maw. The unblinking eye was staring upward. Abe hurried past, trying to ignore the way Chica's head turned to follow his movement. Abe rushed forward, whipping his flashlight right and left as he went. This might have been a fool's errand, he knew, but he had to give it a try. If he found a Gen 1, he'd have a better idea of what he was dealing with. If he didn't, well, that didn't necessarily prove that the Bobby Lots were lying. The underground was a huge area, he wouldn't be able to search it at, uh, to search it all. Abe practically ran through the sewer, dodging past a small army of wandering endoskeletons and mutilated animatronics. As far as Abe knew, no human had ever been hurt by the roaming robots, but he wasn't taking any chances. Abe searched the underground until well after midnight. By then, he was a jangle of edgy nerves. He was hot, he was dirty, and he was discouraged. Even though he was moving fast, he'd been able to identify every animatronic he passed. None of them were Gen 1s. It was time to give up. Abe was almost at the end of the corridor when his flashlight beam landed on a purple hippopotamus. It was a Mr. Hippo! Of all the animatronics, Mr. Hippo was his favourite. Are you serious? <laughs> Why Mr. Hippo, man? Why Mr. Hippo? He was one of the friendlier looking machines. Abe thought of the hippo as a sort of grandfatherly figure. Abe studied the unmoving hippo before him. Mr. Hippo was supposed to have blue eyes and four teeth on his bottom jaw. He was also supposed to have a black top hat. This Mr. Hippo's eyes were missing. So were two of the teeth and the hat. He did, however, still have a flower and buttons on his chest. Abe reached out and patted Mr. Hippo's shoulder. The hippo didn't move. Abe started to turn away, but he stopped when his gaze landed on a hint of purple on the floor a few feet from Mr. Hippo. Abe bent over and picked up a Mr. Hippo magnet. I remember these, Abe whispered. He rubbed his finger over the small Mr. Hippo face. Mr. Hippo magnets were novelty toys that had been recalled several years before. The magnets, Abe remembered, were so strong that they'd shorted out electronics. <laughs> I love this. The magnet probably was strong enough to disable the locks in his apartment. He could use it to get out of his bedroom at night and find out what the Bobby Dots were doing. He could no longer rely on them to open doors, and he didn't want to tip them off to his plans. Abe pocketed the magnet. It was time to go back to his apartment and get to the truth. Abe pulled on his pyjama bottoms and threw back the covers on his bed. He sat down on the edge of the mattress and sighed, feeling a strange longing for the nights when he'd crawl into his sleeping bag in his tire fort. Tonight was the night. Abe had gotten home too late the night before to initiate his plan, and the Bobby Dots had already been suspicious of his late arrival. Now he was going to bed early in the hopes of getting some sleep before he did what he planned to do. Rose and the other two Bobby Dots hovered on the glass panel above the head of the bed. Rose watched Abe with her big pink eyes. Abe looked at all the Bobby Dots in turn. Good night. The Bobby Dots gazed at him unhappily. He couldn't read their expressions very well. Did they feel sad for him? Were they annoyed with him? What were they planning next? Good night, Abe said again. The Bobby Dots blinked out of view. Abe waved, uh, waited a couple minutes. Then he set his alarm for 2am. He turned off his bedside light and got in bed. The alarm woke Abe at 2am. He sat up and looked around. All the screens were dark. So was the apartment. Abe reached under his pillow and pulled out the Mr. Hippo magnet. Since he'd found the thing, he'd kept it with him at all times. He hadn't wanted to leave it lying around for the Bobby Dots to spot. Abe tucked his feet into slippers and shuffled silently to the bedroom floor. Abe swiped the magnet at the lock. It clicked. The bedroom door swung open. Abe crept out of the bedroom and looked around the darkened apartment. His plan was to get to the main terminal near the kitchen, where he hoped he could monitor the Bobby Dots' activity while they were dormant. Abe got as far as the coffee table before he heard the noise. It was the same noise he'd heard so many times during the night. It was a soft swish of movement, and it was close, too close. Abe crouched low, ducking behind the sitting area's partition. He froze and listened. He heard a rustling sound on a scrape. 
Slowly, he leaned forward and peered around the partition. His gaze followed the direction of the sound. Abe had to swallow a gasp. The trapdoor was opening. Abe took cover behind the partition again. He tried to keep his breathing even and silent. He wanted to see what was coming through the trapdoor, but he didn't want whatever it was to see him. After what seemed like a nearly endless few minutes, the sound moved away from Abe. He risked a peek and nearly screamed. Long black cables dropped from the open trapdoor and trailed through the apartment. The cables looked like tentacles, as if a giant black squid was slithering down from the ceiling to find Abe. Several rubbery cables twitched Abe's way. Seemingly alive, they groped and scrabbled toward him. Abe scrambled backward, seeking the shelter of his sofa. The cables pursued Abe, writhing and twitching. They made crackling, rustling noises as they flicked against one another. Abe crawled around the end of the sofa, ducking behind it just in time. Another mass of cables trailed over the coffee table and spread up to the sofa just as Abe dove behind it. One of the cables flipped over the top edge of the sofa just a few inches from Abe's face. Up close, it was clear that the black cord wasn't a snake or a tentacle. It was an electrical cable. But it didn't act like any electrical cable he'd seen. It quivered and pulsed with a life of its own. Abe twisted away from it and looked up at the ceiling. A mass of the writhing cables hung down through the trapdoor opening. The cable near Abe flipped toward him. He flattened himself to the floor and scooted on his belly around the end of the sofa, taking refuge behind the easy chair. There, he concentrated on breathing. Were the cables the Gen 1s? His bobby dots weren't lying. The Gen 1s were real. Goosebumps erupted on Abe's arms. His muscles were taut. Crouched, frozen in shock, Abe listened. The cables made whirring sounds as they slid through the apartment. The sounds weren't loud, but they suddenly seemed deafening to Abe. Or was that the sound of blood rushing in his head? Or the sound of his heart trying to beat its way out of his chest? Abe struggled to accept what was happening. There was an old robot sneaking around Abe's apartment, and it wanted to kill him. Abe scooted around his easy chair. He looked toward the main terminal he wanted to access. Abe's breath caught. He wouldn't be accessing the terminal tonight. A Gen 1 was at the terminal. Abe gawked at the cable trailing robot. The Gen 1 was clearly a precursor to its bobby dots. This one shared Rose's bright pink colouring. But this version of Rose, 3, Abe thought, as Rose had initially introduced herself, was severely damaged. The top of Three's face and one of her eyes were missing, exposing blackened metal beneath the smooth plastic surface. Her exoskeleton was cracked, revealing part of her metal ribcage. The rest of her exoskeleton mirrored Rose's feminine form, except for an open midsection that revealed black wires and servos. And instead of Rose's pink pigtails, Three's hair was made of black, plastic-covered power cables that cascaded from her skull like a tangle of wriggling snakes. It reminded him of Medusa. Abe's breathing had gone shallow, but he forced himself to study the robot. He had to know what he was up against. Whereas the Gen 2 Bobby Dot's colour designations were prominent, outlining their clothing and filling their eyes in the streams of light that made up their hair, this Gen 1's colours were more subtle, Three had one hot pink eye, a hot pink glow from her chest area, and a hot pink light panel on her right thigh, and on a power box midway along one of her cables. As Abe watched, Three interfaced with the main terminal. He was so mesmerised by the robot that he wasn't prepared when it suddenly turned and started moving toward the sitting area, and it was coming directly toward him. But the robot didn't seem to see him. It wasn't reacting to him at all. Three turned to the right and moved toward a wall socket. She either didn't care about Abe, which was unlikely, or she couldn't see him. Standing carefully, Abe sidled around the sitting area to get a better view of the robot. He watched her as she felt around the wall. No, he concluded. She couldn't see. Abe exhaled in relief, but he exhaled too loudly. The robot whirled toward Abe, and she opened her mouth. Three let out an ear-splitting keen that pierced right through Abe's eardrums and speared his brain. He couldn't help himself. He screamed too. She charged toward Abe, her cables writhing around her. Abe tore back toward the bedroom. When he got inside, he slammed the door closed, engaged the lock, and backed away. 
He, pe- he picked up his bedside lamp and brandished it like a club. He listened, fully expecting the robot to crash through the door. His chest heaved. His whole body shook. Abe waited. Nothing happened. Several long seconds passed, and Abe heard the scratching, rustling retreat of the cables. The sound retreated from the bedroom door. Then there was a thump, the trap door closing. Abe collapsed onto his bed. He fell back, then curled up on his side. He now knew who his real enemy was. It wasn't the Bobby Dots after all. <laughs> uh, I will say, like, I when I first read like the leaks of this, um, I had so many different theories going on in my mind. Like, there were so many different possibilities of what could come out of this. Uh, and if you actually want to go and see that, I did make a a Bobby Dots conclusion reaction video. So you can go and watch that. Uh, it's, it's basically me reading through the leaks for the first time and seeing what happens in the story and reacting to it and stuff. Uh, and that, I, I think it's quite a fun video, even though it's like very boring. <laughs> I, it's like a, it's not a great video, but it's cool audio because you can hear me like talking about my thoughts and stuff. Anyway, that's there if you want that. But uh, I'm sure you probably feel the same right now. I'm sure you probably have a lot of theories going in your mind and like thoughts on where this might progress. It is very interesting, let me tell you. Before Abe went to bed the next night, he pulled out his laptop to write to his mom, who lived at a facility to treat her long-term degenerative illness. He wrote to her every week and had been lying to her every week for months about the state of his life, except for a brief window of time when things with the Bobby Dots were good. He hadn't wanted to trouble her with news of the homelessness before, and then he hadn't wanted to scare her with stories of the danger he was in. But after weeks of lying, Abe wanted to tell her something true. He needed some comfort that wasn't coming from a holographic creature. Abe stared at his fingers poised over the keyboard. They were trembling. He clenched his fists. He couldn't tell his mum about what he'd seen. He didn't want her to know how scared he was or how much danger he was in. He thought hard for a few seconds. Then he stretched out his fingers and started typing. Did you have a good day today, mum? I hope you did. My day wasn't as good as I wanted it to be. I have a problem I need to solve. To be honest... It's stressing me out, but I remember what you always told me about problems. If you look at them the right way, there are always opportunities. I'm not sure how what I have to deal with is an opportunity, but I'll do my best to see it that way. I miss you, Mom. I love you. Abe. Later that night, Abe tried to do what he had told his mother he was doing. What else could he do about the Gen 1s? He couldn't go to anyone for help, and even the Bobby Dots couldn't deactivate the Gen 1s or stop them from entering the apartment. The only thing Abe could think to do was to watch the Gen 1s enough to get an idea of how to stop them. It filled him with dread, but he had to do it. Abe's alarm went off at 2am. He rubbed his eyes, gathering the courage to get out of his bed. The Bobby Dots continued to lock Abe in at night. They said it was for his own good, and he couldn't argue with them, not after what he'd seen. Keeping the Gen 1s out of the bedroom was definitely a priority, but the Bobby Dots didn't like Abe's attempts to watch the uh, Gen 1s either, so he kept using the Mr. Hippo magnet. As Abe stepped into the sitting area, his skin prickled. He'd spotted a Gen 1. It was the blue one. Just as Abe had labelled Rose's counterpart as 3, Abe immediately thought of Gemini's blue-eyed counterpart as 1. He hadn't yet seen Olive's counterpart 2, and that was okay. One gen one at a time was enough. Abe pressed back against the wall as one skulked past. He held his breath when the robot turned and looked toward him. When it didn't react, he realised three wasn't the only blind gen one. One was blind too. Was two blind as well? Again, Abe was in no hurry to find out. As one moved on by, Abe studied her. One was missing an arm and the lower part of her face covering, which exposed a blackened metal, tooth-filled mouth and jaw. Her remaining arm was missing its white exoskeleton below the forearm, so her remaining hand was nothing but battered, inky metal. One's cables, unlike three's, emanated from the crown of her head, like a top-knot ponytail. Both of one's eyes shone blue, and she had a glowing blue oval on her forehead, similar to those of the Gen 2 Bobby Dots. He hadn't heard three speak, but one's voice box appeared to be damaged. It was emitting hissing and gurgling sounds. The sounds were soft, but they were unnerving. 
Abe was used to robots, even damaged ones, so he didn't know why he found the Gen 1's appearance so disturbing. If I didn't know they were trying to hurt me, would they bother so much? Or would they bother me so much? Um, he wondered. Yes, even then, he was pretty sure they'd make his skin cruel. It was their cables, Abe decided. Abe shifted his attention to the cables now. He recoiled from the convulsive flow of the black cables that moved along with one. Looking at the black tail-like things streaming behind one, Abe felt like his apartment had been transformed into a nest of vipers. As the cables twitched near him, Abe shrank back, as if a single touch of their twitching ends could kill him instantly. For all he knew, the cables were just that deadly. He really didn't want to find out. One moved off, heading toward the kitchen. Abe waited a moment and then followed her from a safe distance, stepping carefully to avoid the trailing cables. He leaned forward to study her movements. She didn't seem to be doing anything except feeling the counter and cabinet surfaces. It almost seemed like she was looking for something. Maybe she was seeking the next bless Maybe she was seeking the next best place to lay one of her deadly traps. Abe sidled through the sitting area to get closer to the kitchen. Unfortunately, he wasn't as careful as he should have been as he passed an end table. His leg brushed against it and the table shifted, jostling its lamp. The lamp didn't make much noise as it wobbled slightly, just a little rattle, but the noise was enough to get one's attention. Well, what the Gen 1s lacked in sight, they made up in hearing. Her head slowly rotated toward Abe. He froze. One stared directly at Abe. He held his breath. Her servos clicking, one turned away from the kitchen. She took two ponderous steps toward the sitting area. The black cables throbbed and surged. The rubbery cords were only a couple of feet from Abe's legs. He stared at them and swallowed hard, leaning backward. Abe was afraid to move from his position though. Even the stealthiest of steps would get one's attention, and she was close enough to grab him if she knew he was there. One took another step. She was so close that Abe could see each scorched, barren metal tooth in her flayed open jaw. The glowing light from her beaming blue eyes fell across Abe's face. He had to blink and shift his head slightly to avoid being blinded by the intensity of her unfocused gaze. One was so close. Too close. Abe couldn't believe he'd let himself get cornered like this. If one realised he was there, Abe couldn't hold his breath any longer. He opened his mouth and exhaled as quietly as he could. He wasn't quiet enough. One lunged toward Abe, her bare metal hand hinging open, seeking something to grab. Abe had no choice. He had to move. Abe edged toward the bedroom, and thankfully one didn't appear to hear him. With a low hum, her head rotated left and right as she sought him. She reached her single arm out and swept the air around her, feeling for him. Abe took another hesitant step and cringed when his hips skimmed the sofa's upholstery with a soft shushing sound. One reacted immediately. She moved in his direction, blocking his way to the bedroom. Aim, uh. Abe went the other way, sprinting as silently as possible through the kitchen, heading toward the office. Abe pulled the office door closed behind him. It clicked as he shut it. One probably heard that. How long would it take for her to corner him in this small room? Abe put his ear to the door and listened. The slithering rustle of one's cables was coming this way. He turned and looked around. The office was darkened, but he could easily see the hulking shapes of furniture. He scurried over to the desk and ducked beneath it. Abe settled on the plush carpet, pulling his knees up tight to his chest to fit in the tiny space. He tried to calm his staccato breathing as he ignored the sweat that wormed its way down the back of his neck. What would one do if she got a hold of him? She only had one hand, but it was powerful metal. It could easily crush his bones or choke the life out of him. Stop it. He couldn't listen for his attacker if he was entertaining worst case scenarios. Abe wasn't sure how long he'd waited. It felt like hours. His head ached with the effort of trying to listen. But he no longer heard anything. Nothing. No whispers or rustles. No taps or clicks. Had one returned to the cool space? She must have. If she was still moving around, he'd have heard her. Abe pulled in a long, quiet breath. He gently crawled out from beneath the desk and stood up. He painstakingly crept toward the office door. He pressed her ear to it, or he pressed his ear to it, and listened. He heard nothing. Abe reached out a trembling hand and gripped the cold metal of the office's door's handle. 
He held his breath and pushed it down. He paused, then pulled the door open until he could just peer through the resulting crack and see into the kitchen. He looked at the uh, shadows mottling the table and the counters. The area was clear. Then he looked up. A tangle of cables still dangled from the open trapdoor. One was still down here, somewhere. Abe started to close the office door again. Before he could, the cables began to shift, slackening. One was coming closer. Abe couldn't get trapped in the office again. The door didn't lock. He opened the door further and surveyed the apartment. He mentally catalogued his opinions, or options, opinions. He could dash into the kitchen and find a weapon, but what good would paring a knife do against the steel robot? Um, he could race toward the apartment door. No, he didn't want to bring attention to himself by fleeing into the hall in his pyjamas. He was still technically squatting in the apartment against regulations. No matter how scared he was, he couldn't risk someone alerting the front desk. He could stay where he was and hope for the best. No, he was tired, and he didn't trust himself to stay on the alert for much longer. He really had just one option. He had to try to get to the bedroom. Abe looked left and right. Although he could see cables, he couldn't see one. She must have been in the sitting area, probably behind the sofa. That was the direction the cables seemed to stream. Abe stepped out of the office and tiptoed through the kitchen. If he could get around the fridge, it was a straight shot to the bedroom. Abe gauged the distance. He took a deep breath. He moved out, away from the fridge, and he nearly walked straight into one. One gazed directly at Abe, her toothy mouth clenched in a metal grimace. The lights in her eyes pulsed. He gasped. The metal tooth-filled mouth opened. Abe looked into a darkened moor. One screamed. Her voice box was damaged, so it sounded a bit like a klaxon that had melted in the summer sun, still searing, but garbled rather than shrill. She lifted her single arm, her darkened metal hand flexing, reaching. Abe was in motion instantly. He lunged away from one, taking a long step toward the bedroom. Unfortunately, he didn't complete the step. One's hand clamped tightly around his ankle and tugged. Abe crashed to the floor. His head grazed the coffee table on his way down, and pain shot through his temple. He landed on his stomach and the air was knocked out of him with a grunt. The apartment floor quaked as one leaped f uh, toward Abe, her heavy foot landing next to his head. Abe rolled to the left. He managed to avoid her outstretched arm. At least this meant his leg was free. Unfortunately, he couldn't avoid the cables. They were everywhere, and they snapped into frenzied motion, whipping through the air and hitting Abe's bare arms and neck. It felt like he was being flogged from all directions. His skin was abraded and sliced, even flayed in places where wires had broken through the protected cabling. Abe rolled, trying to free himself from the writhing cables. Soon, he was on his feet. Staggering, he tore around the back of the sofa, and that's when he discovered one wasn't the only Gen 1 that had come down to school space tonight. As Abe rounded the back of the sofa, his ankle was once again ensnared by the tight grip of powerful sharp metal fingers. Abe screamed. Two answered Abe's scream with one of her own. When she screamed, her broken lower jaw creaked and flopped to the side. Abe shuddered as he looked into the blackness beyond her metal teeth. If one and three were damaged, two was ravaged. She was just a stripped down metal endoskeleton, topped by a mutilated one-eyed skull. Even her cables were laid bare, copper wiring sprouted from the top of her mangled cranium. Two was nothing but a stark metal torso and skull streaming exposed wires. Two's hip sockets were ragged as both limbs had been torn away. The only way two could move, obviously, was to drag herself along by her arms. She was able to do that amazingly quickly, her movements spider-like. As she squirmed closer to Abe now, her exposed wires sparked around her. One of these sparks landed on Abe's calf, he yelped. Two did the same, and she tightened her hold. Two's grip on Abe was vise-like. Red-hot pain shot through Abe's ankle. He swore he could feel his bones being crushed. Panic overtook him, but the adrenaline that surged with it with it gave him strength. Abe kicked out hard and wrenched his foot from Two's grasp. He winced as he pulled his leg back and jumped to his feet. He turned. He was, once again, face to face with One. Abe paused, 
which gave two time to grope her way up this, his leg and clamp her hands around his thigh. Abe bellowed. Warmth flowed down his leg. One extended her single hand toward Abe's face. Abe pulled his head back, but the metal fingers kept reaching. This was it. They were going to kill him. Suddenly, the TV came on. A perky blonde meteorolo God. meteorologist, meteorologist, whatever, weather report blasted into the room. The sound was deafening. One recoiled and two let go of Abe's thigh. Both robots attempted to cover their auditory senses. In spite of his shock and the excruciating pain, Abe was able to lurch away from one and two while the TV's cacophony distracted them. The distraction, however, didn't last long, because Abe's TV didn't last. One shot toward the flat screen, yanked it off the wall, and slammed it down on the coffee table. Shattered glass exploded through the room like shrapnel. It sprayed Abe like a thousand tiny knives. He curled into a ball, but too late. He could already feel little slices all over his body. Blood coursed down his face, his clothes were saturated. Despite the blood getting in his eyes, Abe didn't think he was seriously injured. The pain was biting, but not profound. He could survive this if he could get to the bedroom. Abe uncurled himself and looked around. The two robots were just a couple feet away. One was turning in circles, feeling the area around her. Two was skittering across the floor, her arms sweeping back and forth in a search pattern. Abe held his breath. One and two didn't know where he was but they would find him the minute they, the minute they moved. Um, Abe looked at the glass screens. As he'd hoped they would, the Bobby Dots appeared. Their eyes wide, their hands to their faces. All three watched Abe and the two Gen 1s in horror. Abe pointed at Gemini. She blinked at him. Abe pointed at the overhead speakers and silently mouthed, Music. Would she understand? Gemini nodded. Rock music blared from the speakers. Let's go, Gemini! The one time... <laughs> we can count on you, Gemini. The one time that we need music. Uh, one and two screeched in anger. They battered at their heads as if trying to disable their auditory systems. Two started crawling up the wall, digging her metal fingers into the drywall for purchase, trying to reach the speakers. Abe stood. One stopped batting at herself. She cocked her head. Abe went for it. He raced across the glass-covered floor and dove into his room, barricading the door behind him with his dresser. He added the chest of drawers for good measure. Then his legs gave out. He sank to the floor. The bobby dots appeared on the glass, ba uh, the glass panel above him. Turn the music off, please, Abe said to Gemini. The rock music stopped. The apartment was still. Abe listened to the shuffle of the Gen 1's retreat, but it gave him a little relief. He lay back and stared at the ceiling. He imagined the Gen 1s creeping along over the ceiling above him. I would recommend you wrap your wounds, Olive said. You'll need a lot of gauze, Rose said. Abe exhaled and sat up, wincing. Abe used the bed to heft himself to his feet and stumbled into the bathroom. Wiping blood from his eyes, he, gaped, uh, he gazed at himself in the mirror. It was worse than he'd thought it would be. He looked like something out of a horror movie. Or a horror book. <laughs> Every inch of his exposed arms was sliced and scraped. His face was cut up. Cuts split his chin, dissected his cheeks, and scored his forehead. One gouge, he realised, had narrowly missed his left eye. Shallow horizontal slashes bisected Abe's neck. One of them was perilously close to his jugular. Blood flowed down from his neck, soaking his t-shirt. The material, which had been a pale blue when he'd pulled on the shirt, was now a shiny dark red. It was cut into ribbons as well. His chest and stomach were lacerated. Most of the cuts were as shallow as the ones on his neck, but one was deeper. Feeling sick, Abe realised he could see subcutaneous fat oozing from between the jagged edges of one six... Oh my god, I'm gonna faint. <laughs> uh, Abe realised he could see sub cutaneous fat oozing from between the jagged edges of one six inch long slice just under his rib cage. <laughs> that is gross. That is, oh god. Oh my gosh. He needed to go to the hospital. Some of his wounds should be stitched. But how would he explain his injuries? What if the hospital contacted the police? If Abe went for help, his entire ruse would fall apart. Technically he was allowed an apartment by his job, but this one was off limits for a very good reason. Fazbear Corporate cracked down on, on rule violations. 
Would he lose his job? Would they press charges? What if he ended up in jail? And how would he pay for the emergency room visit? ERs wasn't cheap, or ERs weren't cheap, sorry. Abe's new job came with benefits, but there was a three-month waiting period before those kicked in. Ah, he's in probation. <laughs> uh, Abe gripped the edge of the bathroom sink, but his legs gave way. He sank to the floor. Weakly, Abe reached into the cabinet under the sink. He groped for gauze and bandages, starting himself with his worst wounds first. He began trying to patch himself up. He was crying after a few minutes, and keening in pain after a few more. He was spent when he finally finished wrapping all his wounds. How much more of this could he take? I had a theory when I first read this that um, basically this is a this is like very crackpot, by the way. Um, so you know how the three Bobby dots like they have like they have parts of them that are like broken, right? Um, and I related it to the shattered animatronics from Security Breach. Because if you think about it, one of the Bobby Dots... Um, okay, I, I, okay, I think all of the Bobby Dots are blind. But um, the first one was, like, explicitly said to not have eyes, right? So that could connect to Roxanne Wolf, who loses her eyes when you kill her. Uh, or when you shatter her. Uh, and then another one doesn't have legs. So that's Monty, because, you know, he, he crawls around with his arms a lot of the time after you shatter him. Uh, and Chica the Beak, I believe, uh, I believe one of them is like screaming a lot, so that could be to do with it. Oh, and and the um and the jaw was like hanging down. Basically, it's a very crackpot theory, <laughs> but uh, it could be like because we have seen a lot of this story so far, like paralleling a lot of the events of Security Breach. So is it possible that these also parallel the events of Security Breach? And is it possible? That the personality chips in the Glamrock animatronics are powered by Bobby Dots or something like that. Or are they the same technology? I would love that reveal. I think that would be amazing. I think it would be hilarious to have <laughs> Bobby Dot Glamrocks. As in like each Glamrock is possessed by an anime girl. <laughs> but anyway, those are like a few crackpot theories for another day. Uh, let me just have a drink. Okay. Oddly, as hard as it had been, dealing with Abe's many wounds wasn't as challenging as answering his co-workers' questions when he went to work looking like a mummy. He couldn't blame anyone for commenting on his appearance. His arms and hands and neck were wrapped in gauze and he had bandages all over his face. Even so, he was already tired of hearing, What happened to you? Walked into a glass door at a friend's house. When his friend rode in... Hold on a second... Rodin isn't from Cleithrophobia, right? No, uh, maybe not. I, I I swear I've heard Rodin before. Maybe it is from Bobby Dots Part 1. Maybe I'm mixing up names. I think it is probably from Bobby Dots Part 1. Um, I, no, I, I thought Rodin was one of the three employees from uh, Cleithrophobia. When his friend Rodin labelled Abe as an idiot for that smooth move, Abe couldn't argue. He was an idiot. He'd hacked himself into a lethal apartment and he was stuck there. Abe managed to get through his morning by remaining very still at his desk. Just before lunch, though, he had to take care of an issue in Monty's Gator Golf. Everyone else on his team was dealing with other pressing problems. Monty's Gator Golf was packed when he reached it. Kids ranging from toddlers to teens filled the jungle-like area, darting and yelling and giggling. The whole of Gator Golf was neon green and decorated with palm trees and ponds. A holographic Montgomery Gator moved through the course during the, his performance, and his countenance was prominently displayed on much of the decor. The Gator Golf area wasn't just an 18-hole mini golf, uh, miniature golf course, it was also a play area. It had a golf ball-themed carousel in addition to a ball pit and a catwalk. Of course, dazzling light was everywhere. Most of the golf course's holes were either jungle or gator inspired, but the fifth hole featured a rotating birthday cake that dripped with forks uh, chocolate frosting. The ball was supposed to be hit through a gap in the cake when it rotated to just the right point in its revolution. According to Abe's work order, the cake wasn't turning. Abe grimaced when a couple of kids bumped into him and stepped onto the path that wound through that wound through the, the golf course. I've got wounds on the mind now. Breathing in the smells of sugary candy, spicy pizza and kid sweat, 
Abe navigated through the course until he reached the cake. There, he chastised a little girl who was pounding on the cake with her golf club. Stop that, Abe told the curly-haired rascal. The girl put her hands on her lips and glared at Abe. Her green eyes flashed and she rubbed at an untilted, uh, uh, at an up-tilted nose. It's broken! <laughs> yeah, well, pounding on it isn't going to fix it. That's what my daddy does to its computer when it doesn't work. Please go stand over there, Abe said with extreme patience. I'll fix this in no time. The girl smacked her lips and gave Abe a dirty look, but she did as she, as she did as he asked. Abe clenched his teeth as he slowly kneeled near the fake cake. My grandpa moves faster than you, the girl said. Good for him. Abe tried to ignore the jabs of pain in his arms as he opened his toolbox. How come you look like a mummy? The girl asked. How do you know I'm not a mummy? Abe asked as he poked at the mechanism to troubleshoot the problem. Mummies don't talk, they moan. Abe let out a long moan. The girl giggled. <laughs> You're funny. <laughs> that sounded so car that sounded so sarcastic. Thank you. Now if you please give me a minute, I'll fix this. The girl lifted her golf club. If you hit the cake again, Abe said. I'll s What? This doesn't... Okay, actually, maybe this does make sense. I... I don't know. It, it, okay, so for context, it says, I'll sick Montgomery Gator on you. But sick is spelt S-I-C, and it doesn't make any sense on the sentence. I think it's supposed to say, if you hit the cake again, Abe said, I'll send Montgomery Gator to get you, or whatever. Anyway, that was a bit weird. Uh, the little girl stuck her tongue out at Abe but she backed off. It took 15 minutes to fix the cake on the fifth hole and Abe felt every second. He said goodbye to the little girl, adding another mummy moan that made her giggle again, and went to the atrium to grab a slice of pizza. When he finished it, he looked at his watch. He still had a half hour of his lunch break left. He was hurting and he probably should have returned to his desk, but whenever he sat alone, his mind replayed the horror of the previous night. He relived being showered with glass shards over and over, so Abe decided to head for Rockstar Row. Maybe watching all the happy families enjoying themselves would make him feel better. Designed to give Pizzaplex visitors a breather between inhaling pizza and playing games, Rockstar Row was a museum-like area that celebrated Fazbear Entertainment's animatronics, filled with neon-wrapped display cases that showcased both old and new versions of the popular robots. The gallery had golden statues of all the Glamrock characters and green rooms for each of the lead animatronics. Abe paused in front of Roxy's green room and stared at the tires and racing flags that decorated the walls. The tires reminded him of his former hidey hole, which he was once again thinking of fondly. They're all kind of full of themselves, aren't they? A young woman's voice asked. Abe blinked and turned to find a petite, brown-haired girl with an almost impish face standing next to him. She flashed a very pretty smile and winked. Her eyes were startling violet blue. Who are? Abe asked. He looked around at all the kids and families. The woman pointed at the life-size drawing of Roxy holding her guitar. The animatronics. They exude confidence. Abe shifted his gaze from the woman to Roxy's image. I suppose they do. Is that a bad thing? Maybe. Maybe not. I haven't decided. That's why I'm here. To decide whether or not the animatronics are too confident? The girl laughed. Her laugh was light and airy, like the flight of a butterfly. Abe liked the sound a lot. Not exactly, the girl said. No, I'm... Wait, why don't we start at the beginning? Abe stepped aside to avoid a couple of roughhousing boys, although the crowds were thick around him and the woman and the music and laughter were relentless. Abe felt like he'd stepped into a bubble. The woman seemed to push reality away from him. Even his pain diminished. What do you mean? Abe asked. The woman stuck out a small square hand with neatly trimmed up unpainted nails. I'm Sasha. <laughs> I'm Eleanor. <laughs> uh, Abe smiled and shook her hand. Even through the bandage's uh, gauze, he could feel it was soft but the palm had a few 
calluses that suggested he, she didn't do a lot of sitting around doing nothing. I'm Abe. Sasha looked at the gauze encasing Abe's hand, but she didn't comment on it. Nice to meet you. You too. With her hair cropped short and her face clean of makeup, Sasha struck Abe as a straightforward kind of woman. Want to stroll with me? She asked. Abe nodded and offered his gauze wrapped arm. Sasha didn't balk. She gently took his arm and they began walking through Rockstar Row. The crowd continued to press around them. Abe continued not to care about anyone but Sasha. I'm a social worker, Sasha said. I work with troubled kids. One of my co-workers wants to bring some of our kids here for an outing, and I'm not sure it's a great idea. Don't get me wrong, I love the Pizzaplex and all things Fazbear. I'm a Freddy fangirl, I'm not ashamed to admit it. But when I started thinking about the animatronics and how they'd come across the kids with, well, issues, I wasn't sure this was the best place to bring them. Sasha looked at Abe's Pizzaplex uniform shirt. You work here. What do you think? Honestly? What would be the point of anything else? Abe smiled. Okay. Well, I think the Pizzaplex is a great place for kids. To a point. The games are fun. The food's good. Kids love it here. But if I was a dad... Go on. I wouldn't leave my kids unattended. And I'd make sure they didn't spend too much time with the animatronics. The robots are fun, but they're a little over the top, Sasha supplied. Abe nodded. He and Sasha zigged in perfect unison around a boisterous trio of teen girls who weren't watching where they were going. What games do you like? Sasha asked. I'm partial to old-fashioned arcade games, Abe said. Sasha grinned. Let's go play. Abe looked at his watch. I have 20 minutes before I have to go back to work. Well, make the most of it. And they did. Abe and Sasha managed to pack in two games of skee-ball and three games of pinball. The whole time they laughed and joked, Abe was smitten. Would you like to have dinner with me tonight? Abe blurted as they left the arcade. Sure. Not here, Abe said. Obviously not. Abe named a Chinese restaurant not far from the Pizzaplex. I'll meet you there, Sasha said. Seven? Abe nodded. Sasha disappeared into the crowd. The Golden Garden was a high-end Chinese restaurant, one Abe wouldn't have been able to afford before he got his promotion. The truth was, he could barely afford it now, but he wanted to take Sasha someplace nice. The Golden Garden had dim, romantic lighting and plush, comfortable chairs. It was filled with the mouth-watering aromas of garlic and sesame oil. I've never been here, Sasha said when they were seated. What's good? Abe pointed out a few menu items, and they agreed on sharing vegetable egg rolls, hot and sour soup, mu shu chicken, kung pao chicken, and vegetable fried rice. <laughs> That's all perfect, Sasha said. I don't eat beef. Neither do I anymore. Olive won't let me. Olive? Abe winced. Why had he said that? He decided to ignore the question. Why did you like the pizza plex so much? He asked. Deflection. Okay, I'll let you get away with it. For now. Sasha gave Abe one of her delightful winks. Abe smiled. Thanks. No problem. I like the pizza plex and the whole Fazbear franchise because of the juxtaposition of the fun and mystery. I've read all the lore about the old locations, the scandals, the rumours. I'm a big mystery fan. Me too. Sasha beamed. I knew I liked you. Abe flushed. But I also love fun. Sasha went on. Fazbear Entertainment is a crazy mix of the two. The waiter brought their egg rolls. For the next half hour, Abe and Sasha focused on their food and bantered about Freddy Fazbear. It's what I do. Uh, when the fortune cookies arrived, Sasha cracked hers open and read, Secrets poison good relationships. She looked up. Uh-oh. You know what that means. Abe toyed with his own cookie. He didn't like fortune cookies. What? We need to circle back to what you said about Olive. Sorry, I can't let you off the hook any longer. Abe pushed aside the fortune cookie. He looked up at his hands. You haven't asked me why I'm all bandaged up, he said. I figured you'd tell me if you want to. Abe hesitated. Then she blurted, or then he blurted, sorry. <sighs> I live in the Fazplat... 
Oh, I'll start that again. I live in the Fazbear Tower. Olive is one of my holographic helpers in the apartment. Sasha leaned forward. Her eyes sparkled. Really? I've heard stories about the high-tech stuff in those apartments. Oh, you have to invite me to your place. I, I have to? If you don't, I'll scream. Abe widened his eyes and Sasha laughed. Not really. Oh, yeah, maybe. Screaming works for my kids sometimes. She laughed again. No, I won't scream, but I'd really love to see your place. I love Sasha, by the way. <laughs> Sasha is such a good character. She fits in so well and the, and like the chemistry be between her and Abe is so well written. I I love it so much. I th I think Sasha is such a good addition to this story. Um Abe tried to imagine Sasha in his apartment. What would she think of the body dots? What would they think of her? He thought about the shattered TV and coffee table in his living room. Having Sasha over would be a very bad idea. Sasha pressed her hands together, tilted her head, and batted her eyelashes. Pretty please, she grinned at him. <laughs> the fourth rejected Bobby Dot. <laughs> um, okay, Abe said. For date two, I'll make you dinner. Awesome! <claps> Sasha clapped her hands. Abe immediately regretted what he'd done. But then again, he didn't. He grinned. He was ridiculously happy, and he was very, very worried. How was he going to keep Sasha safe when she came over? A few days later, Abe walked into his kitchen carrying supplies he'd borrowed from the Pizza Plex's maintenance department. He looked up at the trapdoor in the ceiling, then he set his tools on the kitchen table. He dragged the table across the floor and positioned it under the trapdoor. The nearest screen lit up and the Bobby Dots popped into view. Are we rearranging furniture? Rose asked. Putting the table closer to the refrigerator is a great idea. Abe smiled as he climbed onto the table. Sorry, Rose, this isn't where I'm going to leave the table. He picked up his tools and stood. Is something broken? Olive, said, uh, Olive asked. I can provide instructions for repair. Abe shook his head. Thanks, but I've got this. Abe kept his voice light, but he wasn't feeling relaxed. He didn't like being this close to the trapdoor. Abe felt his heartbeat pick up now that they were watching and pulled out a new heavy-duty lock, hasp, from his pocket. He positioned it on the ceiling and marked the spots for its screws. The trapdoor already has a lock, Olive pointed out. One that the Gen 1s can unlock, obviously, Abe said. They won't have the key for this one. He quickly drilled the unnecessary holes for the hasp and he installed it. Once he'd done that, he fitted a padlock through the sturdy hasp eyelet. Abe climbed down off the table and gathered up his tools. He looked from the trapdoor to the bobby dots. What do you think? Will that keep the Gen 1s contained? It looks like a very strong lock, Gemini said. That was a very smart thing to do, Olive said. Now that you've done that, we can have the special dinner for your girlfriend, Rose said. What are you fixing? Something yummy, I hope. <laughs> Abe smiled. He rolled his shoulders to let go of the tension he'd been holding there. Yes, he said. I'll make something yummy. Abe returned the table and chairs to their usual position and gathered up his tools. I'll start cooking in a bit. Oh, wait, that's, that's Abe, sorry. I'll start cooking in a bit, he told Rose. First, I'll need to clean the place up. Thankfully, that morning, Abe had been able to dispense with his mummy look. His cuts, although still red and scabby, were healing well. He wasn't nearly as sore. That made the work he had ahead of him easier to manage. Over the next hour, Abe removed all the debris from his apartment. He wasn't able to replace the broken table and TV, but the sitting area didn't look too bare without them. Everything else, he was able to clean up easily. Now are you going to make dinner? Rose asked as soon as Abe put away the vacuum cleaner. Abe grinned. Yes, now. Abe had decided to make fettuccine Alfredo with shrimp. That sounds incredible. <laughs> Rose was over the moon. And Caesar salad? She asked. You have to make a Caesar salad with croutons. Sure, I can do that, Abe, <laughs> Abe agreed. You must have flowers and candles, Gemini said the previous evening when Abe had announced the upcoming date. All romantic dinners require flowers and candles. Roses are the most common romantic flower, Olive said. I think I'm going with daisies, Abe had said. He'd already thought about it. Daisies were all he could afford. 
and he was pretty sure Sasha was more of a daisy girl than a rose girl. Daisies always set a fun and playful mood, Olive had said. According to flower experts, daisies represent innocence, cheerfulness and new beginnings. When you combine colours, colours, sorry, they symbolise sincerity. Abe had nodded. Good to know. Now Abe adjusted his multicoloured daisies and simple white candles. He straightened the place settings. Everything was just right. He looked around. The kitchen appeared to be safe enough. It would probably be okay while Sasha was here, as long as he was careful around the stove and avoided the garbage disposal and kept Sasha away from anything but the table. <laughs> But what traps might the Gem Ones have set during the day before he locked the trap door? Abe shifted his gaze to the Bobby Dots, who hovered on the nearby glass panels. Bobby Dots, I need your help. Music? Do you need music? Gemini asked. Actually, yes. Maybe some slow pop music. A romantic ballad started uh, playing from the speakers. Thanks, Abe said. But what I really need is for all three of you to help me keep Sasha safe. Of course we will, Olive said. I appreciate you, Abe said, grinning. His bobby dots giggled. The appreciation issue had become an ongoing joke. Abe wiped his hands on his apron and gave the Alfredo sauce a stir. The sauce was smooth and had just the right thickness. Its buttery, garlicky, gar garlicky aroma filled the kitchen. The apartment's intercom buzzed. Abe adjusted his long sleeve, buttoned down shirt. One of the shirts Landon, the previous tenant, had left. Abe chose it so he wouldn't scare Shasha, Sasha with all his healing cuts. Abe headed toward the door. When he opened it, he stared. Sasha looked amazing in a fitted short green dress. She brushed past Abe and turned to look at him. Um, are you expecting someone else? Sasha asked. Abe blinked at her. What? Sasha gestured at the apartment door which Abe continued to hold open. Abe laughed nervously and let go of the door. It closed with a click. <laughs> Are you okay? You're looking at me like I've grown horns. D did I? You never know. Anything's possible. Her, her chaotic energy is so on my level. <laughs> uh, Sasha battered her head as if feeling for newly sprouted horns. N no, n no, no horns. Whiskers? She rubbed her hands over her clear pinkish cheeks. Nope, whisker free. Sasha winked at Abe. Abe gave her a weak grin. <laughs> Sorry. It's the dress, isn't it? Sasha flushed and looked down at the clinging material that hugged her body like a second skin. I is it too much? I was going to wear jeans, but my friend Meg made this dress up. Abe shook his head several times. No, the, the dress is great. <laughs> really great, actually. Aren't you going to introduce us? Rose piped up. Sasha turned toward the sound and looked at the bobby dots, who were clustered together on a glass panel at the edge of the sitting area. Sasha smiled and clasped her hands together. Oh, hi! Aren't you three pretty? Rose giggled. <laughs> Thanks. So are you. I'm Rose. This is Gemini and Olive. Rose gestured at her fellow bobby dots in turn. Very nice to meet you, Sasha said. I'm Sasha. <laughs> we know, Olive said. He's been talking about you a lot. Abe felt his face heat up. <laughs> I, I need to check on the pasta. Abe strode toward the kitchen. Sasha followed him. So did the Bobby Dots. This is a very nice place, Sasha said. So modern and open. Abe stepped up to the stove. Careful not to put his arm over another burner, he tested the pasta. Almost done. He turned to watch Sasha. Sasha stepped into the kitchen, looked around, then gazed past Abe toward the opening to the office. You're into minimalism, aren't you? Abe shrugged. Not really, this is just how the place was when I moved in. I just hadn't had the chance to do anything with it. If you want to redecorate, Olive said, I can research styles and colours to give you options. Sasha beamed at Olive. Oh, that's so cool! It must be wonderful to have a helper like you. And me, Rose said. And me, Gemini said. Of course, Sasha said. Why don't you tell me all about yourselves? What is it what is it you do for Abe? The Bobby Dots began jabbering about their responsibilities. Sasha, attentive and complimentary, peppered them with questions and showered them with praise. This this is such an adorable scene, I I just have to say. It's so wholesome. 
Abe took the pasta pot off the stove and walked over to the sink to drain the water. He added the drained pasta to the shrimp and Alfredo sauce. Rose winked into view on the glass panel near the kitchen counter. Oh, that looks delicious, she said. But are you sure you made enough for all of us? Sasha looked at Rose, her brow furrowed in puzzlement. Olive must have noticed the expression because she said, Don't mind Rose. She has food delusions. She's convinced she can eat. Sasha smiled at Rose. Well then, you have to join us for dinner. No, she doesn't, Gemini said. This is Abe's first romantic dinner. It's supposed to be for the two of you, not for us. But, Rose began. Hush, Olive said. We'll be back later. Gemini and Olive disappeared from the glass screens. When Rose remained, Olive winked back into view, grabbed Rose's arm and yanked her off the screen. <laughs> the screens went dark. Oh, I've got a massive smile. This is making me so happy. Sasha looked at Abe and grinned. They're delightful. Abe nodded. Yeah, they're pretty fun. Abe gestured at the table. Have a seat. Sasha pulled out one of the padded, straight-backed grey chairs. This all looks lovely. Oh, daisies. I love daisies. How did you know? Abe shrugged. Good guess. Abe set plates of fettuccine and salad in front of Sasha. She waited for Abe to sit down and then she picked up her fork and twirled pasta around it tines. Uh, she put the pasta in her mouth and chewed. Mmm, this is amazing. You made the sauce? Yeah, Abe said. Wow, cute, funny, and he cooks. A triple threat. Sasha, <laughs> Sasha laughed and dug into her salad. Abe flushed. He took a bite of pasta. Um, <laughs> I, I'm wondering if people caught that. Um, because there's a funny pun there. <laughs> a really, really funny wordplay. Um, it, it, it goes, wow, cute, funny, and he cooks. A triple threat. A triple threat. <laughs> the three Bobby, the three Gen 1 Bobby Dots. Ah, oh, it's so good. It's so well done. Sasha laughed and dug into a salad. Abe flushed. He took a bite of pasta. I guess I should tell you I can't cook, Sasha said. Not worth a darn. I can't even boil water. The last time I tried, I forgot the water was on, and the water boiled away and left me with a ruined pot. Abe laughed. Well, don't go too excited about my cooking. My mum taught me to make three things. Fettuccine Alfredo, spaghetti marinara, 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 mar mar marinara? <laughs> spaghetti marinara? I thought it was marinara. Never mind. And tacos. Otherwise, I'm all about the sandwich. I can't even make sandwiches. They end up being either too dry or too squishy. Abe laughed. I bet you make the best squishy sandwiches in the world. Sasha smiled. Where is your mum? Does she live nearby? Abe frowned. I wish she did. She's staying in a care centre. She has dementia. Sasha reached out and touched the back of Abe's hand. I'm sorry. What about your folks? My parents are dead. If they were alive, I'd want them close too. I understand. They continued to eat and chat. Abe was happy with how easy it was to be with Sasha. He thought the dinner was going well. And the whole evening went well too. After they ate, they hung out on the sofa and talked. Before Sasha left, Abe leaned in and kissed her. She kissed him back. It was the best kiss of his life. Abe couldn't wait to write to his mum. As soon as Sasha left, he opened his laptop. He started typing immediately. Hi mum. Guess what? I met someone. Her name is Sasha. She's smart and fun and pretty. I can't wait for you to meet her. Abe filled several paragraphs telling his mum about his time with Sasha. By the time he closed his laptop, he couldn't stop smiling. Um, one other thing, like, about when I first saw this story and reacted to it. I genuinely thought there was something going on with the mother. And, like, there, there could be. There could be something coming up. But I, I had a feeling because it, like... I swear, like, it, we're never really told, like, the mum replies. So I was thinking, like, oh, maybe maybe Abe is, like, delusional and maybe he's typing, he's writing to his mum when his mum is actually dead or something like that, right? That, that would be, like, a big... That would be a big reveal 
right there. That would be really cool to see, I think. If it was like all, if he was delusional or like if he was like on drugs or something, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, that would be really cool. Imagine if he had dementia and like, oh my, oh, that's a scary thought. That's a pretty scary thought. Um, even the thoughts of the Gen 1s couldn't dampen his good mood. Although he had no idea what to do about them, he figured that if he stayed in his locked bedroom, he'd be okay for now. And he was too content at the moment to worry about it more. Um, Abe settled under the covers, and in spite of knowing robots lurked nearby, and in spite of the pain of his cuts, he quickly fell into a deep sleep. 